I believe that your word is true when it says that a nation or a house divided cannot stand. And I believe, Father, that the hope for our nation is in these dear people sitting right here. Men and women who will go out into businesses, and schools, and neighborhoods and become a positive influence for you. Lord, I would pray that today, as we look at a very simple message, what if, Lord, that we might just stop today and realize that we have an ability to change our culture, change our nation, change marriages, change homes, change lives, change schools. One person at a time. And so, Father, I would just ask that right now you would give us receptivity to hear from your word. I pray, God, that you would open our hearts and that you would open our minds as we get ready to open our Bibles. Thank you for this day. Thank you for Jesus. Now, Lord, open our hearts to the possibility of what if. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe that one person can make a positive difference. I believe that. For example, in 1654, one vote, one vote, gave Oliver Cromwell control of England. In 1649, one vote caused Charles I of England to be executed. In either 1776 or 1795, a debate was held in Congress, and one vote decided that we should speak English instead of German. In 1845, it was one vote that brought Texas into the Union, and in 1868, one vote saved President Andrew Johnson from impeachment. In 1876, one vote gave Rutherford B. Hayes the presidency of the United States. And in 1923, one vote gave Adolf Hitler leadership of the Nazi party. I believe that one person can make a difference. And I believe that you and I could walk out of this building, and whether we're going to a business, a neighborhood, or to a school, we can become a very, very positive difference maker if we so choose. I wanted to sort of wrap up things from last year. If you recall, at Thanksgiving, uh, we talked about what a grateful person would look like. You remember we looked at Psalm 75, and in Psalm 75, here's what we learned. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. Men tell of your wonderful deeds. You say, I choose the appointed time, and it is I who judges uprightly. When the earth and all its people quake, it's I who hold its pillars firm. You can read the rest of Psalm 75, but may I ask you, do you think if you and I walked out of here and we exhibited the attributes of a great person, if we actually believe that God is near in our lives, if we actually believe that God is the God of justice and he will right all wrongs in our lives, if we actually believe that God had all power and he could control this universe, and what if we believed Verse 6 of Psalm 75. Promotion doesn't come from the east or the west or the south. But God is the judge. He puts up one and he sets down another. 
What if we actually walked out into our world and believed that God was near, that God will right the wrongs of injustice, that God is all-powerful in his control, and what if we believe that in our lives, if we got this promotion, this job, it was because of God, and if we didn't, it was because of God. Would that make a difference in our life, and would it make a difference in the uh, lives of others whose lives we touch? Yes. You see, I believe if we walked out as grateful people, it would make a difference because the Bible teaches us that in the last days, our culture is going to be an ungrateful culture. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. So if we walked out of here as grateful people, exhibiting the qualities of gratitude found in Psalm 75, would a grateful person make a positive difference in an ungrateful culture? The answer, I believe, is yes. Howard Kellen was a very grateful young man. Howard Kelly was born very, very, very poor. And in order for him to make enough money just for his mother to have some food on the table, Howard Kelly would go from house to house to house to house asking if there was an odd job that he could do. One day, Howard was so hungry that he said, the next house, I'm going to ask if they would give me just a glass of water. Think of the poorest kid you know. That's Howard Kelly. And when he went to the door and he knocked on the door, he lost his nerve. Instead of asking for some food and water, he just said, could I have a glass of water? A woman who came to the door, looked at him, saw that he was starving, and instead of giving him water, she gave him a tall, cold glass of milk. Howard Kelly said, how much do I owe you? She said, quote, you don't have to pay me anything. Mother taught us to never take any pay for being kind. Howard Kelly said on that day, his life was changed by a simple act of kindness. If you and I walked out and we were grateful, do you think that we would change the culture? I believe the answer is yes. After Thanksgiving, we looked at Christmas and we talked about the gift goes on. And we talked about the gift of salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Would our world be different if there were more believers in Jesus Christ going out and sharing not only the gift of salvation, but living the attendant gifts that we talked about? Would our life be different and would our world, our culture be different? My answer is I believe yes. Howard Kelly said that the simple act of kindness from a lady giving him a glass of milk just absolutely changed his life. He had given up on God. He had given up on humanity. He was just a young man, tired, depressed, discouraged, and he felt like there is no future for him. But one woman, one Christian, and her simple act of kindness changed him. 
He says that from that day forward, he decided he would go to school and he'd become a doctor. Fast forward many years. At John Hopkins University Hospital, there was a brilliant doctor who knew about gynecology and oncology. And he was so brilliant that other doctors who couldn't figure out what was wrong with their patients would send them to John Hopkins. One day, the doctors had sent a lady that they simply could not figure out what was wrong with her. The doctor in charge of gynecology and oncology at John Hopkins was given the case. He looked on her chart, and it was a name that he was familiar with. A lady he had known earlier on in life from his hometown. It took a long, 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 long time for Dr. Howard Kelly to treat this woman who had given him early on in life a glass of milk. She didn't realize who Dr. Kelly was. But she had been at the hospital so long she was scared to receive her bill. And when the nurse came to discharge her and handed her the bill, fearfully she opened it, and in the upper right-hand corner were the words, pay in full with one glass of milk. Two Christian people influence the lives of others. I'm asking you, what if you and I actually took Psalm 75 and learned how to be a grateful person, chose to be a grateful person? And what if we took our Christianity and we went out into the world and lived that Christian life would we become positive difference makers in our culture? Amen. The answer, I believe, is yes. You know, Abraham played that what-if game. We all play that what-if game. God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham said, what if there are 50 righteous people? What if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? What if only 40 are found? What if only 30 can be found? What if only 20 can be found? What if only 10 can be found? Well, today I want to talk to you about what if. And I want to ask you, what if you and I took those gifts that we learned at Christmas? What if we learned, what if we took how to live a thankful life? And what if we actually, actually believed God? Would it change your 2019? I believe the answer is yes. For example, we learned about the gift of possibility. Gabriel said to Mary, for nothing is impossible with God. Would your life be different if you walked out of here believing that nothing is impossible with God. Would that make a difference in your life? Yeah. Would it make a difference if you believed that every impossibility was possible with God? Do you remember? Abraham was a hundred, and Sarah was ninety, and God said, Is anything too hard for the Lord? What if that was our mindset? Or what if our mindset was the mindset of Matthew 19.26? You remember Jesus was talking to the disciples? He 
He said, you know, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than a rich man to enter heaven. And Jesus said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. How different would our lives be if we believe in the possibilities with God instead of listening to the devil's doubts? Would your life not be better and would you not become a positive influence on others? Amen. What about the gift of purpose? Luke chapter 1 verse 20. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their proper time. What if you and I walked out of this building and we believe, like the Bible says, that the delay in Zechariah and Elizabeth having a child wasn't God's denial, but it was a delay, but it was a delay for a purpose, for the proper time. Would that make a difference? If you believed that, and if you became a person who shared that with others, would you be a positive difference maker? Or what about every disappointment in your life? If you believe that God is a sovereign God as a Christian, and God allows those disappointments for a purpose, just like he did with Joseph being disappointed, at Mary's pregnancy. Would it make a difference if you walked out of here and you said delay is a denial, difference or disappointment is for a purpose, and I'm going to trust the sovereign God? Because in Psalm 75 2, you learned that God has perfect timing. What if we actually believed that? And just because there was a delay, it doesn't mean denial. It just means it's not God's time. Would you make a difference in your life? Or what if? You have this huge disappointment. But in Psalm 75, 3, we learn that God has all power. Does God not have power to change things? Of course he does. But wouldn't it make a difference? If you and I actually believe, like Psalm 75, 1 teaches, that God is near, he's all-powerful, and that he is sovereign in our lives. Would it make a difference in your life or in the people that you associate with if we believe the promises of God? Do you remember in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, and in Isaiah 7, Joseph was afraid... Ahaz was afraid. What if we actually believe Psalm 75 1 that God is near? And there was no reason for us to be afraid because we have the presence of God in our life. Would it make a difference for you? And would it make a difference in those that you're associated with if you actually believe that God was near? And as Paul said, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Would it make a difference in your life? What if we believe the promises of God? Do you remember Micah chapter 5, verse 2? God said that his son would be born in Bethlehem in Judea. God said that. Well, what if we believe the promises of God? Like Philippians 4, 19, My God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I mean, what if we walked out of here believing that God meets the needs of faithful, believing Christians. Would it make a difference in your life? Would it make a difference in the lives of those that you're associated with? What about if you and I actually believe the peace that God offers to us? You remember what the angel said? Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. What if you actually believe that you're going to walk out of this building and you could be positionally, eternally, peace with God? Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And what if you actually believe that you could think about God and God's thoughts and instead of having trouble and turmoil in your life, you can have that practical daily peace he will keep in perfect peace 
him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Would it make a difference in your life if you believed in God's provision that God Almighty might send Magi 900 miles to give gold, frankincense, and myrrh to you if you needed it. Or maybe, just maybe, and have you go to a bank and you can see the person who had robbed the bank and the bank would give you a reward. What if we actually believe that God would give us those provisions? Or what if we believe that God would protect us? Just how God Almighty protected Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus from ruthless King Herod that had killed between six to 8,000 people and he killed the Bethlehem babies. What if we believe that God could, would protect us? Would it make a difference in 2019 in your life? And then would you in turn be a positive difference maker? And what if, what if, in the midst of all the darkness and all the gloom of the world, we chose like Elizabeth and Zechariah and Mary and Simeon and shepherds. Just to praise the Lord. Would it make a difference in your life? And would it make a positive difference in the others? What if you and I did that? Listen, it's a choice to make. Let me tell you about two brothers, if I might. Two brothers born to the same family. Same parents. One chose to follow God. His name is John, last name Calvin. One of the world's greatest Christians. In the same family was his brother Charles, who chose to live a life of self-indulgence, drunkenness, wasteful, reckless. What's the difference? Parents? No. Home? No. Town? No. Education? No. It's a choice. And all of us make a choice. What if you and I actually chose to believe that what we learned at Thanksgiving and Christmas doesn't need just to be a message we hear on Sunday? Or something that we read in the church newsletter. But it could actually be a life that we live and walk out of here and influence others. What if we did that? Well, how are we going to do it? I knew you would ask, and I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. You know, we talk about worship, we talk about going to worship services, but the Bible says here that when you and I give ourselves to God, that is worshiping Him. When Howard Kelly, the young boy that was given a glass of milk, graduated from medical college, he wrote in his diary, I quote, I dedicate myself my time, my capabilities, my ambition, everything to him. Blessed Lord, sanctify me for thy uses. Give me no worldly success, which may not lead me nearer to my Savior. I wonder what had happened if we all dedicated ourselves to God like Howard Kelly. If we did what Paul said, gave ourselves to him. If we would do that, then the next verse tells us how to enjoy all of the gifts that we talked about at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Because here's what verse 2 says. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So here it is. You and I can be transformed from the inside out. And here's how that happens. I have to make a choice 
that I'm not going to conform to the pattern of the world. Now, for those of you who are love English, the word conform is a verb. It's in the present tense, means now. It's an imperative, which means do it. And it's a passive, which means an outside force makes it happen. Do not conform. Don't be squeezed into the world's mold. Don't do it, says the Apostle Paul. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful men, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. We all begin the new year talking about willpower. We're going we're gonna to lose weight. We're going to do this, this, this. All by willpower. Well, this is a verse about willpower. I won't conform to the world. The Bible says, don't do it. But instead of conforming to the world, instead of conforming to the pressure from without, the Bible says to be transformed from within. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed. No. So those of you who are English, transformed is a verb. Transformed is in the present tense, which means now. Transformed is an imperative, which means do it. And transform is a passive, which means an outside force is going to do it. It is the exact same word found in Matthew chapter 17, verse 2. Therefore he, Jesus, was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. It's that Greek word metamorphosis. It is the change from within. So the Bible says, instead of being conformed to the world, instead of being molded by pressure from without, surrender to pressure from within. Just as Jesus was transformed and radiated light, you and I can be transformed in our living, in our thinking, by surrendering to the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 3.18, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So as you and I make a choice in 2019, not to be conformed to the world, not to follow the pressure of the world, but to be transformed from within, we become more and more and more like what the Bible says we learned about at Christmas, having those gifts being real in our life. But now he tells us how to do that. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now renewing is a noun. And it means to make new again. In the Greek, it's in the dative case, which means the case of personal interest. You know why that's important? It's important because the Apostle Paul says this is important to you. It is to your benefit. It is to your benefit, to your personal benefit, to renew your mind. Titus chapter 3, verse 5 says, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit when we become a Christian. We're a Christian by becoming born again, except in Christ as our Savior. But as a Christian, the Holy Spirit begins to change us from within, right? Yes. Yes. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Thank you, Robert, the rest of you. Respond. Uh, therefore, we do not lose heart. I'm losing heart. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. The Bible tells us if we choose to renew, to make new our mind, 
we will begin the process of transformation. We begin to think God thoughts. We begin to think the way God would have us think. We begin, begin to replace the world thoughts with the word of God, and we begin to be transformed from the inside out. Now, the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here we are as human beings, and we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. I can change my body through diet and exercise. I knew nobody would make that. Down. But in any event, it's true. Diet and exercise, we can change our body. I can change my spirit within by becoming a believer in Jesus Christ and surrendering, surrendering to the Holy Spirit, being obedient to Him. And I can change my mind. I can change my mind by applying biblical truth and renewing my mind by replacing the world's thoughts with God's thoughts. It's possible. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, listen to what Paul said. Finally, brothers, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. It's a command. Think about these things. And it's in the middle voice. We don't have that in the English. But the middle voice means it's something you do for yourself. Think about these things because it will benefit you. It will change your mind. It will renew your mind. And then he says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. So I make the decision. I make the decision. I decide if I'm going to think about God's possibilities or the devil's doubts. That's my choice. I decide if I'm going to think about God's purposes or the devil's denial. That's my choice. I make the decision if I'm going to think about God's promises or the devil's fear. I make the choice if I'm going to think about God's peace or the devil's worries. I make the choice if I'm going to think about God's provision or the devil's defeat. I make the choice if I'm going to think about God's praise or the devil's sadness. It's my choice, my choice, my choice what I think about. Now, Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 17, Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed, you'll be happy if you do that. It's my choice. My choice if I obey the Bible. My choice if I choose to be blessed. My choice if I choose to be happy. So we've talked about what if. We've talked about how we'll do it. Now let me just conclude, almost, by saying, what you need to do right now. And here's what you need to do. You need to do what I need to do, and that is I have to make a choice that I'm going to abide in Christ and not strive. Let me introduce you to our 2019 prayer verse, prayer altar verse, John chapter 15, verse 5. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, he can do nothing. The Bible tells us in Romans 7, 4 and 2 Peter 1, 5 to 8 that we as Christians are to bear fruit. The Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 3 that we're to abide in Him. So let me just ask you, let me just ask you, if you and I would learn to abide and not strive, if we would do that, would your life be better in 2019? So here, here let me tell you. Verse 5. I am the vine, you're the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he'll bear much fruit. So let's say that in 2019 you bear the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness. Would that be so bad? Hello, would that be so bad? Would it be so bad to just go out here having joy? Probably not. What about John 15, 7? 
If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask what you wish and it will be given to you. But it'd be so bad. If you bow your head and you connect it with God and your prayers were answered, would that be bad? No, probably not. John 15, 8. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Would it be so bad, so bad, that you walk out of here and everywhere you went to glorify God? Would that be bad? No, that's the whole reason you're here. What about John 15, 9? As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain, abide in my love. Would it be so bad? So bad that you walk out of here every day, every hour, every moment, every millisecond, you're abiding in the unconditional love of God, and you think, oh my gosh, God loves me. Would that be so bad? No. Number one, John 15, 11. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Now the word complete or full, we've seen it before, it's a verb, it's not right. oh. And it means to cram a neck full of fish, or to take a hollow and fill it with dirt. Would it be so bad? I mean, just so bad? If your life was crammed full of joy, would that be bad? No, no. no. So what I'm saying to you is, we learned in what if how to be a thankful person. We learned about all the gifts of Christianity. Now we learn how to do it by the transforming of our mind. And now we learn what we need to do. Abide, non strive. So I would just say in conclusion, it's now up to you and me. What if you did this? God offers blank. Why do I settle for blank? For example, God offers peace. Why do I settle for fear? That would be a good question to ask, wouldn't it? God offers peace. Why do I settle for peace? What if I actually believe it? Or, God offers possibility. Why do I settle for the doubts? Why? What if you and I actually took God at his word? What if we accepted the gifts that are ours? I bet not one of you has left gifts under the Christmas tree unopened. And yet, we'll live in 2019 and have not opened all of these gifts that God offers to us. Why do we do that? See, it's up to you and to me what type of life and what type of legacy we're going to live. Have you ever heard of Alfred Noble? Inventor of dynamite. One morning in 1888, he was reading the newspaper. He was kind of shocked. He read his obituary. And what happened was the reporter had gotten it wrong. Alfred Noble hadn't died, his brother had died. But he thought it would be interesting, so he read his obituary. He found out that the world saw him as the dynamite king, the great weapon maker, a man whose whole life was death. They actually called him the merchant of death. And he was so upset at how the world saw him, he decided to change the world's perception. So in his will, he left money for people who would promote peace. And the result is the Nobel Peace Prize. He wanted to change the perception of people concerning what if you and I actually fought? I want to go out into this world and I want to be a positive difference maker for Christ. I want to change the perception of people so I can be a positive influence. Could you do it? Could we do it? We could. Because we now know how by the renewing of our mind and we know what we need to do. 
we need to stop striving and start abiding. So here's the connection. Are you going to choose? It's your choice and my choice. Will you choose to unwrap the gifts associated with Jesus at Christmas? Will you do it? There are honored to unwrap. Will you choose to discipline yourself and renew your mind? Will you do it? It takes discipline. Will you discipline yourself to renew your mind? And will you choose, choose to remain, to abide in Jesus? Remember that story about Zacchaeus? The Bible says in Luke 19, 5, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay, I must remain, I must abide in your house today. Just as Jesus went to abide, remain, stay in the home of Zacchaeus, we are to remain, abide, stay in Jesus. Is that, is that what you'll do? Because it's your choice and mine. Where are you going to spend your eternal day? The Bible says in John 1, 12, as many as received him, to them he used the authority to become a child of God. The Bible says in Revelation 3, 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I'll think that you can choose to accept Christ as your Savior today. And you can also choose, you can also choose how you're going to live your earthly day. John 15, 5 says, that if I remain in him and he remains in me, then I am going to bear much fruit. I'm asking you, what choice will be yours? In 1947 in Fremont, Michigan, there was a very angry man. He was angry because his wife was making him late for an appointment. So he did what many of you, I wouldn't do this, <laughs> do, and you would subtly pace back and forth, encouraging your wife to hurry up. His wife, Dorothy, was not impressed, so she was feeding their baby. And she said to him, or this is what she did, she said, I dumped a whole container of peas into a strainer and a bowl, and I placed them in Dan's lap. And I said, I'm late, because every day, three times a day, I'm going to strain this food and feed it to the baby. You do it. Point made. Remember, it was 1927. The next day, Dan Gerber decided <laughs> to do something about it. It is so easy to gripe and to complain, right? What if you and I decided? To accept Christ as our Savior, unwrap the attendant gifts, renew our mind, stop striving, start abiding. Would your 2019 be better? And would you, would you, become a positive difference maker? The answer is yes. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Now, Father, there might be somebody here who's not a Christian, and I would hope that today they might choose to accept Christ as their Savior. But Lord, I imagine that most of us here are already Christians. And we're going to have to make a choice. And here's the simple choice. I can leave all of those gifts that we've talked about unwrapped. I can leave them packaged up, and I can walk out of here just defeated instead of thinking of possibilities. I can have fear instead of the peace. Lord, it's my choice. I can renew my mind or I can not. And I can strive, 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 or I can learn to abide. Lord, the choice is mine. It's time for us to make a decision. And I pray, God, that we will make that decision right here, right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. Stand, sing with us.
I'll be here if you'd like to talk.